Did you know there are rivers in the sky? No, really. I know it might sound like I'm pulling your leg, but sometimes you just have to go up and look a little higher and then a little higher still. But they're up there, I promise you. Look, there goes one now. These flying rivers are actually much more important than terrestrial rivers because they are what move fresh water far inland from the coasts. If it were not for the flying rivers, lands more than a few hundred kilometers from the nearest sea would be dry as a bone, because clouds carrying water from the oceans would soon become rained out. The amazing thing is, we are so utterly dependent on them, and so few people even know they exist, and fewer still understand why they are there. But the flying rivers of inland exist due to hundreds of billions of pumps all around our planet. We call them trees. But where do these flying rivers come from? Well, you might think of it this way. There are two kinds of rivers in the sky, atmospheric rivers and flying rivers. Atmospheric rivers have their origin in the lower latitudes of the planet and over the ocean. There, the strong sun heats both air and water. Warm air is very good at carrying water. And under the sun's influence, the ocean is more than happy to evaporate. This evaporation begins to fall into regular bands that can be as much as 2,000 kilometers long, 1,000 kilometers wide, and rise from sea level up to 3,000 meters. Influenced by the Coriolis effect and the displacement of atmospheric pressure systems, these atmospheric rivers track generally northeast in the northern hemisphere and southeast in the southern hemisphere until they make landfall, where orographic lift that is the rise created by hills and mountains and general uplift of the continental plates over sea level will push the moisture-laden air of the atmospheric river into colder upper altitudes. Cold air cannot hold much water vapor and this induces precipitation and that is why we see moisture climates on the seaward side of mountain ranges and drier climates on the lee side. Atmospheric rivers account on any given day for about 90% of the movements of water vapor from the oceans to the land even though, because they move only in narrow channels through the sky, they cover only about 10% of the Earth's surface area. But, no matter how large and water-laden an atmospheric river is, once it runs into a continental plate, it quickly drops its load of water. And within just a few hundred kilometers, the atmospheric river will have precipitated entirely into the land. Beyond that point, everything inland should be dry desert and desiccated dunes. And indeed, in some regions of the world, this is exactly the case. We can see examples in deserts such as the Sahara, the Mojave, and the Atacama. If areas far inland are to get rain at all, another mechanism must come into play. And this is where trees, in particular healthy woodlands, become all important. They resurrect the fallen waters of the atmospheric rivers and general precipitation by transpiring groundwater in the form of water vapor back into the air. And this inland atmospheric water becomes what is known as flying rivers. Let's take a closer look at them. Hang on to your hats, this is going to get bumpy. Our journey begins on the peaceful east side of the Andean Mountains. This mighty mountain range rises almost 7,000 meters and can entirely block the flow of flying rivers, atmospheric water just on the other side. But as we begin to descend the east side of the mountain range, we encounter billowing clouds, the front of a mighty storm, and the hallmark of one of the greatest sources of flying rivers on Earth. Towering clouds create buffeting winds, near typhoon force conditions, and if our little aircraft is not torn apart by them, we'll make north and east, descending from our present 5,000 meter altitude. Plans are thrown askew when a vicious crosswind nearly rams our little aircraft into a mountainside. But giving the engines full throttle and running with the wind to gain altitude saves us at the last moment, until finally we come to the edge of the storm bank and find ourselves descending at last into the mighty Amazon jungle. A vast river lies below, not the Amazon River, but a mere tributary. And descending to ground level, I marvel at all the life it sustains. Tens of thousands of species, countless organisms and humans depend upon this mere tributary of the Amazon River. And rising far above it, we see below the rainforest itself, off to the horizon, a realm of hidden waterfalls, trees as big as skyscrapers, and species yet unknown. It is a place of unworldly beauty. Throttling straight up into a climb, a beautiful hidden waterfall lies here. And diving again, banking north, we encounter a mere tributary stream, 
something that back in my home country of Canada would be counted a mighty river. And even from my present altitude of 150 meters and over the hum of the propeller, I could almost swear I hear the life down there, the songs of birds unknown and the sweet fragrance of greenery and flowers in bloom. As the sun sets, my co-pilot and I return to the river to take in before full dark the grandeur of its beauty. And as I again descend to skim over the water, I am struck by the profound reality that as impressive as this river seems, the real wonder is the rainforest. For those countless billions of trees each pull water from deep in the earth up through their leaves and release it into the atmosphere and thus combine to make the mightiest flying river of all, moving water into the sky. It falls again, bringing rain when the trees call it, and those trees then use the water and then once again send it into the sky, moving it ever more inland, so that a vast continent that should be as dry as the Andes mountain is well watered and a rainforest. These are the flying rivers, the sky water that is essential and the gift of the trees. So precipitation, whether in the form of atmospheric rivers or the ordinary evaporation of ocean water, which then moves in the form of clouds, brings water to the continents. The continents rise, pushing the clouds ever higher, causing them to cool and condense into precipitation. Rain. It takes yet more to create rain, but we'll come back to that. But what is important to know for the moment is that that initial push of precipitation is played out within just a few hundred kilometers of any continent's coast. Inland, the air should be dry. That it isn't is the marvelous work of trees, in particular, the work of forests. Here, we see satellite imagery of the Amazon rainforest. Notice the ripples playing over the image, like raindrops that have fallen upon the surface of a pond. This, somewhat though undoubtedly poorly, simulates the work of trees, for they, with their deep roots, draw the water back up that is precipitated to the earth, move it through their trunks, and transpire it back into the atmosphere through their leaves. That water re-enters the atmosphere, travels, and eventually precipitates again to be absorbed and then transpired by forest further on. It can be well and truly said that it is due to the work of forests that the inland of any continent is green at all. We see this if we look just a bit further south, where, to the west of the continent of South America, the mighty and magnificent Andes mountain range blocks the flying rivers created by the Amazon, and the Chilean coast range, which runs along the edge of the continent, blocks atmospheric rivers, making Chile's Atacama Desert one of the driest and most sterile places on Earth. But this, at least, is a natural phenomenon. If we look further east, toward coastal Brazil, we see something else entirely. Here, much of the Amazon rainforest has been intentionally clear-cut, or burned, or destroyed, to grow cheap beef, to sell for cheap wood, and accommodate urban sprawl. And with much of the forest gone, the flying rivers weaken, and the land becomes drier. If we once again take to the air, and fly over this easterly region of Brazil, we discover a shocking sight. The Amazon rainforest, the very lungs of the planet cut away to the horizon, clear-cut, and even climbing thousands upon thousands of feet, the clear-cuts still go on beyond the horizon. But I said I was going to share with you something about how it takes something more than simply evaporated water in the atmosphere to make rain. Indeed it does, for there is a secret to rain a secret the trees and the forest have long kept to themselves, a secret only now coming to the light of science. I take to the woodlands, as I frequently do, my companion Gilly Doo romping at my side, and I carry with me a small but powerful drone, and when we come to the right place, we'll send it up and see what secrets it might tell. I notice that to the west lie cumulus clouds, and overhead, a lazy horsetail is painted across the sky. These are harbingers of rain soon to come. But if ever the rain is to fall, something else needs to happen. Something so few people know anything about. And yet, like the sky rivers, 
it is absolutely crucial to the survival of us all. It is a mystery that has been kept by the trees, who have been as secretive about it as they are about the nature of their language they have shared since long before man through the fungal threads that tie them together beneath the soil. Through the process of transpiration, the trees exhale volatile organic compounds and even microbes. And if it hasn't rained for a while, if they are thirsty, they do so even more. These isoprenes, terpenes, and monopenes break down to become hyperscopic aerosols. That is to say, they attract the water vapor of clouds into droplets, and the droplets condense and become raindrops, and the raindrops fall. Quite literally, when they so desire, the trees, especially when they have the strength of an unbroken and mature forest, can summon the rain. It is the sun and the ocean that bring precipitation to the continents, mostly through the atmospheric rivers. But once that precipitation has made landfall, it is trees, ancient and benevolent, and working together for the common good, that create flying rivers, the water that falls from the sky deep inland. And these all-important flying rivers account for as much as 40% of the world's inland precipitation. Measures from around the world indicate that not only is the world heating, but it is also drying. Rain is falling less and in more concentrated areas, and rivers are producing less output. And mounting evidence indicates that this global drying is strongly correlated to massive clear-cutting of forests around the world. This satellite image shows the region just outside Canada's famous Ketchumkujik National Park. The pale areas indicate vast clear-cuts. I've been there. From the ground, they stretch beyond the horizon. This kind of damage to the forest ecosystem is seen all around North America, Europe, Asia, and everywhere else. But the science is becoming ever clearer. Not only do trees capture carbon, mitigating the effects of climate change, but trees with the combined strength of a healthy forest create flying rivers, and then bring the rain. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of all matter of topics relating to natural science, from ecology and conservation to the nature of the universe beyond our Earth and making that information practical with solid advice on living well with the natural world. If you appreciate the program, please take a moment to subscribe. Subscribing costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.